Uh, my name is Ori, and I'm here to talk about Qtau 2 and VMD. Um, so I'm going to start uh, blathering about a few different sections, starting off with what actually is Qtau 2, how do I use it, and then the uh, main part of it, which turns into a code review of uh, the implementation, kind of. Um, OK, so before I start off, are there any questions? So that, so the way I prefer to go, I feel free to stop me at any time. Um, I'd rather deal with confusion or uh, people getting lost early rather than late. And if there's an interesting sidetrack, I don't mind going down it a little bit. It's not a challenge. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so why am I, why did I end up writing QCAL2? Well, last year at BSD Ken, Peter Hessler was talking about how he really wanted it and he fooled me into looking at the spec. I looked at the spec and I went, oh, that looks like a weekend project. <laughs> a yeah, three line diff. Uh, a few weeks later, I had a diff. It was 700 and some lines, so a little bit off, but not that bad. Uh, so if you want to fool me into doing stuff, I think I've given away the secret. <laughs> um, anyways, so why do we care about QCAP2? Well, before I go into QCAP2, let me talk a little bit about what we had before, raw disks. Here is a diagram of the structure of a raw disk image. Um, it's just a giant chunk. Every, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. So you have a, you write to offset 1,000 in the disk. You write to offset 1,000 in the raw disk image. Uh, every byte is that you could potentially use is represented in the raw disk. So this is actually has a few upsides. It's pretty fast. It's pretty reliable. Uh, so you don't have to worry about any higher level structure in there. You're not seeking around to figure out where you need to do the writes. Um, and any failure mode is going to be your file system shipping itself. So they're good that way, but they've also got other problems. They're wasteful, and they don't have snapshots. Everyone loves snapshots. So QCOW2 solves those two issues. QCOW2 is the native QMU disk format, which means that if you are using QMU, You'll also be, you'll be able to just boot up your QMU disk in VMD, um, assuming all the other stuff in the VM actually works. We'll be able to read the disk. I don't promise that it'll boot. Um, it does copy on write, so a little bit of a lie there, but it mostly does copy on write. Um, so that means that if you have snapshots within the disk, they'll be the new data will be blocked, will be copied before it's modified. Uh, it grows on demand, so you start off with a very small disk image, and as you start putting more stuff into it, it gets bigger to accommodate, and it does snapshots. It actually does two kinds of snapshots, but anyways, all of this sounds a little bit like ZFS, and if you have ZFS, why would you want this? Well, we're OpenBSD, we don't have ZFS, so we want this. <laughs> um, cool. So, as I said, there are two kinds of snapshots. There are internal snapshots, which are snapshots within the QCAL2 disk image, and there are derived or external snapshots. So these, these are where you basically chain together disk images. You have, your, you have your base image, and then you have a derived image that points back at it, and you can chain these as far as you want. So the derived image can point off to a derived image that points to a base image, and so on ad infinitum. So now that you've got a general idea of what it is, of what QCAL2 is and what it does. I'm going to go into how you use it with VMD. So there's actually not much different. You have your, uh, whatever worked with a raw image will probably just work out of the box with QCAL2 image. The biggest difference, right, so the biggest difference is when you create the disk images. So you can either do a VM title create QCAL2 colon test.image dash s32 the QCAL2 prefix says make, build, make this into a QCAL2 image instead of a raw image. Alternatively, you can uh, just give it a .QCAL2 suffix and we'll decide this is a QCAL2 image and make it, a, make it that way. Uh, nothing surprising here. This is all hopefully pretty uninteresting. Um, and as you can see, after we create a test image, you've got a 256 kilobyte disk image. It's there. You can use it you can do stuff with it. So for example, you can start a disk, start a VM, point it at the disk, 
Um, and here I'm being way over uh, specified. So you can, uh, you do stuff to the end. In this case, I believe what I did was install an OpenBSD on it. And you can see it's grown to one and a half gigabytes of disk space. Grow on demand as, as advertised. Uh, if you want to do a snapshot, you can do, uh, you can do VM kernel create qcow2 derive.image dash b test.image dash b specifies your base image. Um, as you can see, the derived image points at the one and a half gigabyte base image, but it's uh, only 256k. Um, and as you write to it, it will grow. Uh, and it essentially just contains the diff off of the base. So you can continue doing stuff with the VM. And when you're done with it, delete it, create a new uh, derived image. That's how you roll back snapshots. OK, so, oh, and the last one is in disk snapshots. No one's bitched with me enough for me to implement it in the VM couple command. So use QMU. Uh, we're compatible. That's the nice thing about using a well-defined format. So here's where the code review starts. Um, so how does it work? Well, at a very, very high level, uh, QCOW2 disk image is essentially a page table. And you have, uh, in the QCOW2 documentation, they call them uh, clusters. Um, basically, you add a page table and grow the disk for fresh pages. So here's a diagram. You've got the metadata chunk, which points to two different uh, tables. You've got the L1 uh, table here uh, and the L1 reference count table here. So when you look something up, you go walk down the L1 table, find the L2 chunk that uh, it refers to, um, and the L2 uh, and the level 2 for the reference count actually contains the count, 16-bit uh, number for each uh, chunk of data in the reference count. And then you have the data pointing down, and then the L1 L1 chunk, sorry, the L2 chunks contain the um, pointers to the data blocks, which may or may not be in order on disk. With in-disk snapshots, you get a very similar structure, but you have multiple metadata blocks that you uh, walk down to the data on. So you start off with, uh, for this snapshot would point to this set of uh, L, this L1 table, um, the, which points to L2 tables. The L2 tables can be shared. Uh, in this diagram, they're not because the arrows got confusing. So, yeah. And then the data blocks are also mostly shared. This one is not, hence the different color. So, any offset can be kind of broken up into uh, three different sub chunks. You have the cluster offset, which is how far into the data you're reading. So, for example, if you want to read only these bytes, then you have a cluster offset that points into the middle of the chunk. You have the uh, you have the L2 uh, section, which points to how far off into the L2 block you go. So, this one would have an L2 offset of zero, and then there's the L1 offset, which points into the which indexes into the L1 table. Um, I think I forgot to mention, the L1 table is always contiguous. Um, OK. So how do we plug this in? Well, when I started with uh, QCOW2, uh, I saw that we were just directly doing P read and P write directly on, into the raw disk, which makes perfect sense. It's a simple interface. It's, it does exactly what you want, almost. Uh, and it uh, works. So I basically took that and said, well, I just want to have everything called the same functions, but I want to be able, able to overload them. So I created a struct bird IO backing, which contains the point, a void pointer to some data. Uh, in the raw disk format, it contains a pointer to the file descriptor. In QCAL2, it contains a pointer to the QCAL2 state struct. Uh, you have PRead, PWrite, and close, which all map directly to the file system and operations. PRead reads a buffer from of, of length len from the offset off. Uh, PWrite does the same thing, but instead of reading, it writes. And close cleans up the resources, flushes whatever is in memory to disk, and does 
any cleanup that needs to be done to make sure that uh, the disk is consistent when you're finished. Uh, the QCOP2 disk image starts off, always starts off with a header, and you, we read out all of the data that we care about from that. So you've got the starts off with a magic number that identifies it as a QCOP2 disk version 2. Um, it has a version number just because the magic number isn't quite enough for some unknown reason. Uh, it's got the backing offset and backing size, which is your back pointer to the chain disk. Yes? Code review question. Is this Indian aware or do you care? Uh, this is uh, all, I believe, it's Indian aware, or sorry, it's, it's, ND, it's I believe, little Indian on disk. I could be wrong, it could be big Indian. Like right? you've defined format as it, being X yeah. Indian. Okay. Yeah, and then we do the swapping when we read it in. Um, yeah, so the cluster shift lets you actually define how big each cluster is. The disk size is exactly what you think, how many bytes the disk is. The crypt method is the um, encryption that we use. Uh, we don't actually support any right now, but patch is welcome. Um, the L1 size and L1 offset say where to find the L1 table. The ref count offset and ref count size says where to find the ref count tables. And the snapshot count and snapshot size is where to find the snapshot table which we don't really do much with at the moment. Uh, then there's the incompatible features, which are features that, if they exist, we can't load them. Auto-clear features, which are features that, if they exist, you can use them. If they don't exist, you need to turn them off and because you may corrupt some caches or something. And then there's the compatibility features, which uh, compatible features, which you can just pretend, you, you can just ignore. And then there's a ref count size because someone may want more than 65,000 snapshots. Um, okay, the main, uh, the core of the uh, QCOW2 disk image is the translate function, which is really the only actual code I'm going to go into. Um, it takes the offset into the disk and figures out where to go. So starts off by grabbing the L1 offset, dividing by the cluster size and the L2 size, which if you go, if you think that gives you the index into the L1 table, indexing into the L1 table gives you the offset of the L2 table. The offset of the L2 table is gives. There's a little bit of uh, extra stuff in there. So specifically, there's one bit in there that says whether the QCOW2, uh, whether you need to copy the data or not. So that tell. This means that. Well. If that bit's set, you don't need to look at the reference count at all. Uh, if the value is zero, we don't have that, and we just return zero. Um, otherwise, we get rid of that bit and uh, find the uh, read the uh, offset off of disk from the uh, L2 uh, page. Um, you notice that the L1 table is in memory for performance. The L2 table, because we're, we end up seeking around a lot and we're reading off disk. Um, we're not reading the whole cluster, but just the data that we care about, and we're uh, hoping that the buffer cache will actually keep the uh, data in memory. Thanks, Bob, for fixing that. Um, so, and then we have the cluster at the end. Um, so, how do we update the reference counts? You may notice that we actually didn't pay any attention to this. Well, we're lazy about it. We all we care is that the uh, QCOW two bit is set. In, or the copy on write bit is set uh, or not. If the copy on write bit is set, we copy the cluster and set the reference count to one. If it's not, we just write in place because nothing else is sharing it, nothing else cares if we're modifying it or not. Well, then why have a reference count? Uh, the reference count's updated with snapshots, but it's also de it should be decremented when we uh, finish, when we copy something on on write, and that will mark it as you know, unused. We don't do anything with that, which means that if you create a uh, in-disk snapshot and then delete it, or create an in-disk snapshot, modify the data, and delete it, we'll link the clusters that were written. That should be fixed. Um, but as far as I'm aware, no one's using in-disk snapshots, so it's not currently a big deal. So I'm just going to go through a few uh, Set operations to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, first off, case zero, reading the data. Let's just say that the data is already there, and we just need to know where it is. So 
we've got our uh, simple disk uh, over here. It's got one uh, data cluster with a L1 table, an L2 table pointing at that, and then uh, a reference count. So all we do is we walk down, find the L1 table, find the L2 table, grab the data out of the block. Now, what if the data is missing? Well, the disk's virtual, which means that the data is always there. It's just what's, what is it if you haven't written to it? So we fill it in with zeros. Um, you, know, you, you go through, you find the L1 table, you find the L2 table, go, oh, there's nothing in this cluster. Well, we must, our read must return zero. Um, so for writing, uh, well, let's just say that the data is there, it's not shared, and all we need to do is update it. So we walk through uh, the first cluster, or so we walk, we walk through the metadata, find the first cluster, uh, sorry, find the L1 table, find the L2 table, and write to the data. The data, uh, the data is there, we just need to write in, find the cluster and write into it. There's nothing too interesting about that. Um, now, what about writing shared data? Let's just say that there, this is in a snapshot, and someone has, and we're writing to a new snapshot. Well, the data is there. Someone else ha can see it, which means that we can't mm -hmm. modify it in place. So, we copy the data on write. So, when writing to the, uh, so in this case, we go through, we find the data is there. Uh, we, we start from the, the metadata cluster, go to the L1 table, go to the L2 table. The L2 table doesn't have the uh, copy on write bit set. So, and in this case, the reference count is yellow, not green. So, that, that's indicating that someone else can access this data. So we need to make a copy. So we make a copy. Um, in this case, I'm also assuming that the uh, L2 table would need to be copied. So we end up needing to go L1, L2, copy, uh, and then find the data and copy it, and update all of the blocks going up the tree to the root to make sure that we have the new uh, data visible. We also need to copy the, uh, to update the reference count of the new block. And in this case, we set it to one for green. So if we need to write new data, we'll need to create a new block. And we may need to create a new L2 entry. So in this case, we want to. Uh, we walk from the metadata to the L1 table. The L1 table should not be blue. Um, essentially, we have no entry there. So we need to go through and uh, create the L2 entry, and then create the data entry. It looks a lot like copy on write, except instead of copying, you're just creating a new block. Um, F truncate the disk, toss the data on the end, update everything going up to the root. Um, okay, so what if we need to read from an internal snapshot? Well, for reading from an internal snapshot, everything I've just uh, gone through uh, still applies. Where uh, the only difference is that is the only difference between internal snapshots is what you start from. So where you have this metadata block, you may have another one over here that you point at uh, a different L1 table from, and you just walk through. For uh, external snapshots, well, the data might not be in the first place we look because we've got multiple disks. So we need to follow the list of base images. For reading, this is pretty simple. You do the walk, you find the L1 table, you go, oh, that data is not there. Let's look at the base image. The data is there. Well, then you return it. Exactly the same as if you hadn't done any, uh, if you hadn't had the base image. If it's not there, you keep going and Eventually, you hit the end of your chain of base images, and 
you backfill just as though the indicator wasn't there at all. Um, now, on the other hand, if you're writing, the data might still not be in the first place you look, but we can't just uh, assume that uh, we need to put it into the, we just, we can't just copy on writing the place that we find it because now you're modifying the wrong disk. Uh, you're not getting a disk. This was a bug in the first versions. Um, so what we end up doing is we walk down to the previous disk, copy it over, and then update the tables in the new disk. So the disk keeps on containing the diff of all the writes against the base. So all of that seems simple enough. What about reliability? Well, raw disk images are still your best bet there because there's a whole bunch of big pieces of data to update. Uh, what happens if, for example, you update, you write the cluster and then uh, crash? Well, now you've got the, uh, you've leaked the cluster, you, and you're not, you haven't updated all the uh, parents. What if you crash while you're writing the parents? Now you've got an out of sync uh, table. So you're, there's still some, there are a bunch of windows for uh, corruption. I think right now several of them are big enough that you could drive a truck through. Uh, I'd like to get them a little bit smaller. Maybe, maybe we can get them down to the point where all you can drive through is a minivan. Uh, but QCOW2 is not the most reliable disk image. Um, it's not terrible, but I've definitely seen corruption when uh, crashing VMD. Uh, don't crash VMD. <laughs> um, so as far as the next things I'd like to work on, there's known bugs. So the leakage on the uh, uh, in disk images is something that I'd like to fix. I'd like to take a look at maybe doing some external journaling to fix the uh, uh, reliability issues. So do a write ahead log on an external file, uh, record what we're going to do to the disk, and then actually do it. And that way if we crash we have something that we can replay. I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Um, the other thing that we're doing right now that really sucks for performance is every time we access the disk, we're actually doing a system call to read and, and write. Um, it might be worth keeping the data in memory instead of uh, hitting the disk on every access. Um, we can also do an, a neat thing like, um, so right now when we do a search for a cluster, whatever on every read, we'll chain through all of the uh, disk images until we find something. If we've, we can keep a uh, bloom filter, for example, to say which disks contain a cluster. And that would let us skip going through the uh, start of the chain. Uh, there are a bunch of extensions that are useful, that are probably useful in QCOW2. I haven't taken a look. Uh, it might be worth figuring out if we want to pick some of those. And making internal snapshots an officially supported part of the uh, QCOW2 tool chain would probably be worth doing. Um, right now, you know, right now you need VM. Sorry, right now you can't do anything with internal snapshots using VM Cuddle. Uh, you need the QMU tool to manipulate those. So that's basically all I have. Um, I think we're kind of early. Uh, I yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about the uh, reliability issue where you you write the to the L1, you write to the L2, then you write the data. Yeah. What if you did it in reverse order? You figure out what you're going to do, then do it in reverse order. You may lose data yeah. if it crashes, but it's a crash. I mean, all kinds yeah. of things can happen. But when it comes back, you won't have a corrupt data disk. Yeah, I think we can do a better job about that. Um, I'd have to think if there's any other issues with it, but yeah. Um, the other. There are other pieces of data that we also need to update, like the reference counts. Um, I think we can update those first, though. Um, so, ref so if you do the reference count first, the worst case is you leak a cluster. Then you do the, uh, uh, then you do the write to the cluster, maybe the copy. Uh, then you do the, actually, if you update the reference count you, first, you might grow the disk and get an out of bounds cluster. So we'd have to deal with that. Um, 
But yeah, we can definitely do a much better job about consistency. I assume you have some sort of process that can go through the disk and find uh, and, and fix you know, corruption. Uh, currently, no. Currently, we need to, current, there is a QM tool that will report corruption. I don't know if there's anything that will fix it. Sounds like it's. It wouldn't be too crazy to write. Yeah, the format's actually yeah, the hard part. <laughs> yeah, the format's not too hard to manipulate, so we can probably do that. Um, any other questions? What are some of the extensions that are possible? Uh, I would have to look at the spec again. I don't remember. Uh, there's definitely a bitmap uh, for uh, the copying, so you can you can actually ideally store it all in memory and not have to hit disk on every uh, reference count operation. Um, yeah, I'm trying to remember what others. They were mostly... Uh, compression? Oh yeah, compression is... Encryption? Uh, encryption is not an extension, that's uh, in the base name. Uh, compression, I think, might be an extension. Um, I definitely didn't see a field for it in the uh, header. Um, yeah. Are there any extensions anyone here is interested in? We can also do our own. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, not specifically the key count, but uh, what are the uh, storage formats for in VMD? Uh, in VMD, we just have two. We've got uh, QCOW2, and we've got raw disks. And is there any thought about Having a, uh, one for VMD? Or? Uh, I haven't thought about it. About if anyone else has. About having a VMD specific format? Yeah. Or uh, not necessarily specific to VMD or other format? QCOW2 seems to be the, the Latin of VM that this backend storage where everything translates into it and everything translates out. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention you can translate between raw and uh, QCOW2 disk images, and as a hack, that will also clean up the leaky clusters. So convert to QCOW2, convert back, and you'll get rid of those. Yes? Any thoughts to raw VMDK, which is nothing more than a file that describes the raw image? VMDK, you don't have to implement all of the SSI VMDK structure. You can actually use a raw file with a little text file. It's very easy to convert a normal VMDK to one of those hmm. before exporting. This is for VM transportability. Hmm. It's how I actually migrate VMs off of VSX onto other VM platforms. Uh, what does the text file value? Key equals value. Very simple. Well, you need lots of samples. <laughs> it, no. describes, it describes the image. It describes the image. It tells how many blocks are the metadata. It tells how many head sectors are. Um, I think it gives it a UUID of some size. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure we actually. <laughs> you you literally would be supporting it as a raw type, other than yeah. the fact that you read the MDK text file to uh, to get parameters of the raw file. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's not QCAP. It's not QCAP. It's not QCAP. It's not QCAP. It's not QCAP. No, it's just another extension to yeah. to support another type in VMD. Yeah, and it sounds like it wouldn't be hard. I think the hard part of that would be, I don't know if we actually support setting the UUID and so on in the VMD. Oh. Yeah, so we'd have to actually add support to that for VM, in VMD, mm -hmm. in the emulated hardware. Um, okay. Um, yep. Okay, so. I can do a demo um, if anyone's interested. Cool. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so I've got a bunch of VMs here. Um, some of them are QCOW2, some of them are not. So I'm going to ask if you can make it bigger. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes, yes, they, yes, I can. Uh, yeah, some of us have old eyes. <laughs> yeah, let me try to remember how. Uh, um, control, control shift. Windows, uh, 
Nope. So that is not you're running here. Huh. So this is ST. Uh, Hmm. I think it would be a command to the window. It's definitely there's definitely key binding for it. I just yeah. oh, okay. um, hmm. just pipe everything through banner. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't find out in thirty seconds, the old guys just lose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Including me, I can't see them. Uh, <laughs> Let me think. Another color might work better. Oh, yeah. nope, that's not it. Okay. I, think <laughs> I think I just closed the window. <laughs> Everybody who likes hipster pastel colors on pastel colors has never given, hasn't given presentations about it. Yeah. <laughs> don't use reverse video. Don't use pastel on pastel. Use dark on white. Don't really work with well, that's, that's actually what I was thinking. This is way oh, dark. Yeah. Fine. Better? Yeah, I don't think yes. Yes. Oh, I'm already in that directory. Let's see how well this works. This is my turn. It is probably not very smart. <laughs> um, okay, so <coughs> actually, I do have X term. Does anyone know the key code for making it bigger? You can right click. Yeah, control right click. Okay, that's easy then. X term. Uh, Control right, Control right click and gigantic, large or huge, huge, huge. huge. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, much better. <laughs> um, Actually, try large. There's no guarantee that. There's no guarantee they're actually. Uh, no. <laughs> that's huge. Okay. Well, that's as good as you get. <laughs> okay. What does it say? One. <laughs> okay, so uh, so I've got my uh, OpenBSD image, which boots. It's got a QCAD2 format, and currently it is. Where am I? Oh, yeah, it is about 1.8 gigabytes in size, 1.7. And I can boot it. It does things. Uh, it does not do them very well. <laughs> <laughs> X term is not deals with this. That's okay. You can still run it. Yeah, tell it you had an X term. Your your term catch wrong. Term catch wrong. Yeah. ST two y same. ST two y space same. Well, it booted. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It will shut down now. <laughs> and then I will ask if you want to sing. You don't want to do a demo in the head? <laughs> I could, but no. But, but, but the lesson you've learned is when the hecklers make you switch your tools, there's a two word answer to the hecklers. <laughs> <laughs> F you? Yeah. <laughs> That's two letters. It's also a two word response. <laughs> okay. SC2I same. TSET. TSET same? No, TSET return. Ah, okay. Here. LS. Yep. Okay. <laughs> so I can create a uh, disk image off of this, so. Um, 
create derived image qcal2 dash v open bsd dot qcal2 um, dash s actually I don't need the dash s because it's a base image it knows about the base image's size it actually needs to match otherwise things will kind of go sideways when you try to read outside of the base image so Dang. Yeah. Need to be rude. Oh. There we go. So I've got the uh, derived image. Now I can boot the derived image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, oh. It did yeah, something. You started with me on um, Yeah, I'm going to switch to the other terminal where it kind of works. Actually, oh, that's better now. It's fine now. Oh, okay. I've seen it be cranky on external before. Okay. I just wrote it off to write. Cool. Mm -hmm. So I think it's the old screen that's reading. Yeah, this confuses it. Yeah. Yeah, the full screen mode. Go back. Yep. Okay, so I've got my uh, VM on. Let's write, let's scribble on the disk. Oh, let me show you the, let me prove that the disk is small. Uh, control right click. Huge. Huge. Extremely not huge. <laughs> um, And you can see it's 124 megabytes. What is it written on boot? Oh, it relinked the kernel. It relinked the kernel. <laughs> there we go. And shuffled all the shared libraries around. Yeah. And that'll do stuff. OK. And I am writing to the disk. And it's growing. And I filled the disk. So, yeah, as you can see, QCAL2 is working. And I guess that's about it. And uh, finally, the other OBSD.Q2 did not change. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, It did not change. In fact, it should. It will actually complain if it's not a read-only uh, file, I believe. So we don't even open it with write permissions. Um, yeah. The other interesting thing that I probably should have put in the slides but didn't uh, is there's a whole dance around getting the file descriptors into uh, the QCAL2 uh, disk or into VMD uh, because of the uh, trip set. So, there, so VMD does not have permissions to open anything. For a long time, if you use the derived, derived image, things would go kaboom un, until you, uh, well, things would go kaboom if you didn't comment out all of the pledge and uh, CH root and so on. So that corrupted a few disks. Um, the, reason for so what happens is you've got a control process which you need to signal from VM Cuddle to tell it to open the, di the disks, pass in an array of file descriptors for all of the derived images, and send them all to uh, the VMD process. And until you do that, you can't open the disks. Uh, so the VM doesn't actually have the ability to open any files on your disk. Features does QCAL2 offer that you filter implemented? Is it like is it redundant with what we have in software, or could you do something different or uh, complement each other? Or? I think it's 
if you care about having it, all right, well, if you want to run operating systems that don't have full disk encryption, then encrypting your QCOW2 disk is useful. So otherwise you wouldn't use it. Um, I, I probably use the internal open disk except for a VM. Uh, if you, it's useful if you don't want to use it for whatever reason, but I don't think there's any particular advantage other than it's guaranteed that regardless of what you run, it would be encrypted. If I understood correctly, the base image must remain unchanged as long as you want to use the derived image. Yes. So as soon as you have a, as soon as you derive an image from a base image, things will get very, very unhappy if the base image changes. Um, How does it keep track of changes or not? Is there a sort of checksum? No. Uh, it keeps track by uh, through the sysadmin. <laughs> so. <laughs> If you, it's up to you if you decide to break your direct images. Um, we set them at, turn off the read, per, sorry, turn off write permission before you, uh, uh, well, turn off write permission on the base image to prevent human error. But well, you said it, it will complain if you derive. Yeah. And it's not read only before, right? Um, it should. If it doesn't, it, I should fix that. I have another question. So if you have a derived image, um, is there a way to mount this without putting a VM and putting files in it, and then having a VM boot it? So that, for instance, you would like provision some, some base template for a machine, and then you go and say, OK, I have to, I have to a derived image of that, and it has this a sage key and this host name in it. And I mount it basically in the host and swap some files around and just to close it and then with the machine it comes up as an installed BSD box. Um, would that be possible somehow or is it? It's possible for those people. Yeah. We, we have tools at work that do that sort of thing. It's, yeah. it's, it, 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 you're a disk, so yeah. what you need to do is probably, it, you need to know what file system the VM itself wrote on top of that disk. Yeah. yeah. So, and so, pretty much no it's not so, assuming, so you assume it's FFS, yeah. and then you'd have to have a way to, in user land, emulate that block device. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you have fused. Yeah, you have fused. You have to be fused. Yeah. And then mount FFS over top of fused. And then you'd have to actually know about the Q factor format. Too. Yeah, you have to know about the Q factor format. So, could be what you've got to be yeah. adapted for Q factor. Q factor. Change your mind yet. <laughs> if you wanted to mount it in the host, are you yeah. serious or are you totally No, 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 it's <laughs> serious. It's what these cousins It's what these cousins for. It's what these cousins for. It has to be what these cousins for. So, yeah. yeah. Create a small Create game. Create a new cousin that speaks to Cal. Yeah. Rip the Q Cal code from BMD and just attach it to these cousins. And the code itself is actually fairly small. I checked before this talk. It's under 800 lines. And you don't think Q could be simpler for that? No, no, Fuse no. will be far less. So it's still, you don't have Fuse, you're in the wrong layer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuse, you're in the mid layer. Yeah, yeah. you need to be in the block layer. Yeah, this yeah. is a block layer. Yeah. 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 You should use the kernel's FFS yeah. to deal with the uh, FFS on the, on the disk. Yeah. On the disk. Yeah, it should be. So, three line dip. <laughs> um, it, like, the problem is you need to analyze SCSI, so you need to be SCSI. Like you need to skip yeah, all SCSI already does that. You just put no, you need to you need to do the target. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. sure. It's just SCSI target code. Yeah, I, I've at least been involved in two projects that involve basic SCSI target code. <laughs> well, various stages of my life. I'm happy. I'm, 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 I'm not doing it again. <laughs> 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 I was a simple B SCSI. Yeah. How many derived images can there be? Uh, can there be more than one derived image at the same time running? Yeah. yeah. So you can have uh, fifty uh, clients running off of uh, derived images, all sharing the same base. So this is actually why it's kind of interesting. Uh, Peter keeps telling me he's got some code that's work that he's working on for ephemeral snapshots. Uh, where you basically can create a disk image and say, I only want it to run with these disks for this long, 
or I only want it to run with and throw away the diffs when you're done using the VM. So you can do that. You can boot as many VMs as you want off of that. And this would be great for, say, testing. If you're doing, say, file system development and you want to poke at it, and if you screw up the file system, go back to something that's actually workable, this is kind of a useful feature. Um, or if you want to do one I'm far more interested in, oh, look, I'm screwing with libc today. Yeah, there you go. Oh, look, I just made my system unusable. <laughs> oh, I'm going to go back to these issues. <laughs> yeah. Um, or if you're doing anything else that will screw up your system and you're doing development on it. Uh, very useful. That's what we yeah. do with web. Yeah. yeah. I do all my installs on VMs with disposable file systems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, QEMU has a snapshot option which does exactly that. Mm -hmm. And it creates the drive images, unlinks it so it's hidden away from you. You can use it. And I would use this for uh, simulating networks if we're doing like, like kernel yeah. testing on kernel development. So, yeah. <laughs> this up, it'd be fine. When I'm done, delete it because I don't care. Yeah, uh, regression test would be another yeah. great place for this. Yeah. Um, as a side note, I, initially I had implemented the ephemeral snapshots where we kept all of the diffs in memory instead of syncing them to a disk. This turns out to be a bad idea because we tend to run out of memory fairly quickly, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you can do this easily when you when you start your, your if you want it disposable when you start your derived image. Yeah, you simply have an option to where VMM unlinks the file. Yeah, yeah, because it's just going to open it. Yeah, pass a descriptor. It can unlink the file. The file is gone. Yep. As soon as you close, as soon as VMM stops and the last yep. opener closes, that shit's gone from the file system. Yep. I have that it. in the wrong place. What? Yeah. I have all that code in the wrong place. Yeah, you just need to put it in. Yeah. 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 Uh, the only thing that's a little bit uh, iffy about that is where do you put the image? Doesn't matter. Well, it does if you put it on temp and your temp is kind of small. Yeah, sure. Oh, don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, like you get down. Down. My point is, is you could do it in your directory right like oh. where it is today and then just as soon as it starts it unlinks it. Sure. It will continue to use space in the file system and as soon as of your course. VM exits it's, it's pretty hot. Yeah. Well the problem with that is what if you want to put your uh, if you want to have users write use a ephemeral VM and have root own a, own a space image or something where you don't necessarily have write permission to the VM or the directory containing it. Yeah, sure. There, there's a whole bunch of touchy uh, questions yep. around it that are that are very, very bike shed worthy, mm -hmm. which is why I didn't end up doing it yet. I guess I'll probably end up reviewing your code for that. Uh, we have control has still a lot of options, so you, we, we can add more flags. It's easy. It's not Alice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, as we can see from Git's UI, it clearly works very well. Oh yeah, absolutely. The last good screen again. That's fine. There's nothing interesting going on there. Um, any other questions, comments, thoughts, complaints? Okay. 